Another talk. Models and Myths in Plato's Symposium. I'd like to do something this evening. I'd like to do first to talk about two ideas, which if we understand, the rest is easy. Simple ideas. Personification and symbol. What is personification? When you have a set of ideas which come together into a unity, and when that expresses an idea which can be represented as a person, personification. Now, can it be a real person or a mythical person? The whole problem of communicating is using images. If you have a lot of ideas you want to express and you want to express them in a unity, personify it, communicate with it. I'll mention a couple of names and quickly all such of sorts of ideas will come <coughs> to your mind. Adolf Hitler, set of ideas come together right, so that he can represent that set of ideas. Magic Johnson, Franklin Roosevelt, Lincoln, all of these people can be said to represent a set of ideas so that when you think of the person, you think of the ideas. It works the other way around too. It goes both ways. Therefore, a person can represent a set of ideas, a set of ideas can be represented by a person. When those qualities you're talking about are ideal in the most perfect sense, then the personification becomes a symbol. Therefore, tonight we're going to be talking about beauty. All right, we're gonna be talking about beauty. We're going to be talking about love. We're going to be talking about reality. We're going to be talking about wisdom. What's curious about these ideas is that we don't normally, we do not normally in our culture identify that set of ideas that have the unity. We argue about whether or not this idea should belong to that set, whether it can be represented, whether it should be included, whether it should be excluded. And therefore, we don't really grasp certain ideas the way they can be grasped when you see that certain ideas are necessary. It's a set of necessary ideas that have a unity. It's not arbitrary, it's necessary. Now, we're going to explore these this evening. We're going to take it on a personification, later symbol. Now, here's the problem. Mythology stands with and expresses a metaphysics. The metaphysics can be expressed in a mythology. The mythology can, ex can be the figurative expression, figurative expression of metaphysics. So I would rather reverse things this evening and turn it upside down and talk about the metaphysics first and show you that if you do accept a certain view of the nature of reality, the mythology naturally follows, the images must follow, the figures in the myth must follow, and it makes perfectly rational sense.
So let us start with what we've come to from past talks. Let me summarize a few things. All right. There is a highest and ultimate, the one. That's the ne negative. That's the de negativa. That's that without which nothing else is, but which itself can never be described since it's beyond all categories. Now, the one expects that all existence, is that right? Pardon me? The one has, it's all inclusive, right? No. Okay. No, not all inclusive. It's the source of everything, but it itself is nothing. Okay. To use Plotinus' great statement. It's the first hypothesis in Plato's Parmenides. But, you see, Anything, anything that is real has an influence. No influence, it's not real. The, the influence, as it were, of the one, we can put it in other terms, and we can say, uh, the consequence of the one We can talk about it in terms of, I like to think of it in terms of uh, the most brilliant nature of the one is nothing other than the effect of the one being what it is. Well, let me then therefore just call it, as Plato calls it, the most brilliant light of being. So there is a one. This can be known. This cannot, this is not an object of knowledge, the one. The most brilliant light of being stands to the sun. It is most brilliant. It's the, actually, it is the source of the sun source of life and all things that follow from it. But right now, let's just stay with this one aspect of it. That there is a one, it's an ultimate term, it's beyond all categories, and it radiates. Right? We can call this the radiation of the one. The splendor, the light of being. When it is experienced, from what we've said before, in its experience is, is experienced as beauty. In that experience, nothing can be even can possibly conceived to be higher than it. It's the end of man's quest. It's the reason for his existence. It's fulfilled. In that experience, one encounters joy, raps, happiness, source of happiness. Now look here, so how can we express the relationship between the one to the other? Well, look here, you see, this is something that follows this not temporally in terms of time, but it's because of this that this exists. This, in that sense, it's the light of being, it comes into, it comes into being. Therefore, we can say, at, of course we're talking about it in the purest terms, we can say, since it comes into being, we can call that tremendous thing, that, that most magnificent thing, a birth of beauty, can't we? It comes into being, it is itself beauty, and certainly coming into being, it should have been celebrated by all the gods. Well, 
there must, we can then talk figuratively and say, when we talk about the pure light of being coming into being as beauty, we can say there must have been a celebration in the heavens for the birth of beauty. Since it comes into being, it's the birth of beauty. Oh, when it came into existence, then obviously, whenever it can be said to be encountered, whenever it can be said to be encountered, then one is overwhelmed by the beauty and therefore seeks to return to it again and again and again. And in seeking it, one does everything one can to experience it once again. Therefore, it's a follower. Right? It attends to everything necessary to gain access to that experience once again. Okay? Once again. Not yet, once again. When you say celebration in heavens, that implies another reality. Yeah, yeah. That's why I said it's figurative. We want to talk about it just in the figurative sense, okay. right? Uh, now, what would that experience be like? Well, it must be overwhelming. Nothing else is possible, nothing else can compete with it. It's a totally overwhelming experience. So one would be, one would be oblivious to all else. That is to say, one would be unconscious to all else, and would be one conscious only of this. Now, whatever brings that experience about, whatever that is, would prepare the person for that kind of an experience, and therefore we can say that whatever it is that brought them to that experience, they passed out, they became oblivious to all else. Now, oh yeah, we can use that term. We can say they passed out. And whatever they took to bring that about, since this, this, is, this is, of course, in the realm of uh, nature of reality, it's immortal, right? divine. It's called immortal, the realm of the, of the divine. Anyone who experiences it, therefore, brings it about, they, they must be doing something can bring about that kind of experience. Therefore, you know, what might be used to describe that one would become oblivious to all else. Wine. No, no, that brings too close to everyday drunkenness. So we need something that's, that can mirror the immortal uh, nectar. Nectar. Because the very word nectar means deathless. And it's also said to be the drink of immortality. So therefore, anyone who has this overwhelming experience, we can say we're drinking, we had a cup of overflowing with nectar. So we're just continuing this image, are we not? By the way, if anyone had ever experienced this, the thing that's necessary to experience it is the mind itself, the pure mind, in Greek called nous, or intellect though we don't often use it this way, I'll put intellect right now. Right? Though obviously it has that, it's the noose, it's that part of the mind which is capable of seeing into the nature of reality. That's intellect, that's noose. So where this is taking place must be the highest functioning of noose or intellect now, if we wanted to capture that in some way, if we could say, are there any gods, Greek gods, that represent intellect, the overflowing of the intellect, uh, the fullest development of it, 
the flowering of the intellect? Ah, oh, flowering of the Zeus, Zeus. Zeus is called the intellect. And by the way, Zeus's gardens would be the, uh, obviously, the overflowing of Zeus's gardens would, would re represent that very state, wouldn't it? The garden represents the overflowing? Well, isn't a garden overflowing? Right. Depends on what's not kept. Pardon? It's just let it go wild, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now yeah. look here. We now, looks like we can talk about this fabulous kind of vision in terms of the metaphysics of Plato, or metaphysics of the Neoplatonic world, or the Greek world. And we can say, by the way, that uh, beauty among the gods, Greek gods, Aphrodite. So we can say, I know what we can do, we can say that uh, the gods were holding a, a celebration in the heavens to celebrate the birth of Aphrodite. And then if we can celebrate the birth of Aphrodite, then at that time, you know what must have then emerged? Whenever beauty was discovered at that moment, what did we say? The person would be overwhelmed and seek it again and again. In other words, what happens when anyone experiences beauty? Desire it. Therefore, at that moment, love must come into existence. For the desire of beauty is love. Therefore, this personification we're going to use is going to be called Eros. Or, see, we'll call him Eros. So we can say then, there, so we can personify Eros now as that person, personification, who then caught a glimpse of this, and once they caught a glimpse of it, they were hot on the trail for it, did everything they can to get back to have another and deeper, more penetrating, or even shallower experience to take anything at all, as a matter of fact, as, so long as it's of this. So look here then. We need then a celebration of the heavens to celebrate the coming into being of pure being, the light of being. It's experienced as beauty, so we'll call that Aphrodite. We'll have him pass out on nectar in the garden of Zeus. Man, since he does that, he will be the attendant and follower in every way of Aphrodite since he wants to get back and do everything he can to experience that beauty again. For anybody who loves anything and is beautiful must follow it and attend to it, or it's not love. Right, right. Now we all know that. Now look here. What we need to do is to see more about the origin of this figure we just personified and called Eros. Now, let's do that. Let's change it. Let's raise a couple of difficult questions for our culture. We don't like asking a set of questions, but once you see the value of these questions, obviously you can get into it. And what you're getting into is metaphysics. So look here. What is beauty, love, wisdom, reality? What is the origin of love, beauty, reality, wisdom. What power does it have? It being, of course, any one of those four or other things. Now, So far we've talked about the origin of Aphrodite, you see. We've talked about the origin of Aphrodite. Only in respect to her birth in that one moment. So we're now talking about the personification of love and calling him Eros. So if we inquire who was his father and who was his mother, then what that would mean, would it not, is 
that the mother must represent a set of ideas, a set of ideas which must have a certain unity and that unity must be capable of being personified by his mother and again his father. There has to be some sense in which we can speak about both. So long as that represents also a set of ideas which can be brought together into a unity, personified, look here, personified, that's the father, this then is the mother. Now look here, you know, to have a myth, you need several things or you don't have a myth at all. Most important thing is that it has to serve the highest function, it has to serve a high purpose has to serve the need to illuminate some very profound idea. That's its goal. That's how mythology exists. Right. It also must have characters. At least one of much must be divine, or if not divine, the son of a divine, son or daughter of a divine. The characters themselves must have a set of characteristics so they can be distinguished and talked about. There must be a setting for the story and a drama. If you have these elements, you have a mythology. So our purpose is very clear. We want to understand, we want to understand this, this most interesting figure, which is Aphrodite. That's our goal. That would be our goal. And Aphrodite represents beauty. Therefore, we'd like to understand beauty. Therefore, we're really asking this question. What's the origin of beauty? Uh, we could ask, what's the origin of love? What's the origin of wisdom? What's the origin of reality? Because the same way of exploring any one of those questions is equally true for all of them. That's what mythology is doing. So look here. I'll give you the story of this myth in Plato's Symposium. We will start by saying, of course, the gods held a feast, a banquet, to celebrate the birth of Aphrodite. It was a great occasion, and plenty came. He was a god, and he stepped out to the park, the garden, Zeus's garden, and was drinking nectar, and he enjoyed it immensely. And by the way, he was observed by Aphrodite, uh, pardon me, by poverty. She was in a doorway, hoping to get close. And sure enough, that nectar got to him. Bang, he passed out. He passed out. Poverty saw her chance. Sex in heaven. Blushing it is, nonetheless. And in heavens, of course, Eros was born. Right? And therefore, once Eros or love was born, he is in hot pursuit of Aphrodite, where he must be the attendant and follower. Now, we said before that each of the characters must be identified and what each one of them, how each one of them is described, we need a list of terms. From the story itself of how each one of them are described. When you have then the characters, the way in which they're described, the setting that they have, then you can then get the drama such as we represented and so what do you do with it? Go a couple more steps. Here in this beautiful picture, you see the same thing, what we just did. Now, in this one, you should be able to read the myth and get the, the particular way in which each one of these figures is described and write them all down. All right. 
if you did that, then you could arrange it. You could arrange it in a very interesting way. And this is called the matrix of ideas. If you were to do this, you can do it. All it takes is reading carefully. You list the characteristics of the mythical figures, poverty, plenty, love, Aphrodite. You list them here. Then you go back into the dialogue and you look to see how each of the people are being described in the dialogue. How they describe themselves and how other people describe them. Then, would you not agree? You should then be able to see whether how many of those items check off for each of the people in the dialogue. This will get you a very interesting problem. And I'd like to talk a bit about that problem and the value of the drama in understanding mythology. All right. There are approximately 50 terms There are approximately 20 people mentioned. You can then check off your table, we'll call it a matrix of ideas, and you will find that, let us give a couple of examples. We might be able to look and say, this fellow by the name of Aristominos is very much like poverty. So as poverty is to plenty, is to love, so too it looks like, since Aristodemus checks all of those, or most of those, we could say, so too Aristodemus is to whoever, oh, let's see, who in that last look, Agathon looks very much like plenty. And suppose we went further and said, you know what? It looks very much, very much like Apollodorus. Is like love. You would get, you would get, if you did this correctly, you would get at least four and possibly six possible candidates for this analogy. That's the problem of the many. You get too many. What are you going to do with it? Is everybody like poverty, plenty, and love? The solution is that you take whatever, whichever equivalences you find, and you now put it back into the myth to see what consequences would follow for the myth. You'll find then, let's do the one we have on the board for the moment. Then, Aristodemus must have all of those qualities and he must be standing by the doorway and he must be like that figure that we just described, all the qualities identifying poverty. And plenty, let's assume for the moment, Agathon has all of those qualities. Then Agathon must get drunk on nectar and those two get together and conceive Agathon? It's absurd. Only one will fit uniquely when you apply the table to the way in which the figures function. When you apply it to the way in which they function, all drop but one. Now, let's hold that for a moment. All right. We'd like to try to see how we can represent the power of love. Because we have two goals tonight. We want to talk about mythology and we want to talk about models. And we're going to pull the two of them together. So, let's do that next. 
And that will bring us back to f four cognitive functions. It'll get us back to personification. It'll get us back to symbolizing. I want to leave this part up here. The basic dialectic that precedes the, the construction of the model takes in brief form the following set of question and answers. One, if there is such a thing as love, would you agree it responds very positively to the presence of beauty? Fair? Would you go further and it may even respond much more strongly and positively when it discovers that the beauty it finds is good. Mm. And when it finds something beautiful and perceives that it's good, its object then is to try to, to bring that goodness out of the beauty so that they can then participate in it. But going back to this question, now look here. That means then that there is a love not of nothing, but of something. And therefore, would you not agree if it's love of something, not nothing? It's a desire for that something for a very important reason. Would you not agree when someone has a desire for beauty and perceives it as good, when they get it, what do they get? They're happy. And you don't have to ask any more questions, says Socrates. But now, one more step to this. Look, this is rather curious. Eh? That means love and desire exists when there is a lack. Now, this is a very important question because some people want to say, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. It's not when it's a lack because certainly when you have the object of your desire, when love has the object of its desire, it may still want to continue possessing that object and since it doesn't have it in the future it can still desire to possess in the future since you don't have the future it can continually desire to possess what it has now but to continue that possession on into the future well then Socrates now in the myth Plato now in the myth has to work on this idea of the power of love. Because if it doesn't have any power, it doesn't exist. The one has a power, can be said to be, have a power because after all it has an influence and its influence is the most radi radiant light of being. So he says, look here. He said, there are two things, the immortal and the mortal. And love is in between the two. And I put it out here very clearly. You see, love is said to be between the two. And being in between the two, there's a certain power it has because it uses its power to ferry across from men to the gods, petitions and sacrifices, because all petitions and sacrifices and prayers and things of that nature must always be accompanied by love or it isn't effective. Equally well, we, from the immortal side coming back are commands and the urgency to start anew if you ever made a mistake, which is sometimes called a requital. Through that love come all the arts of divination, the art of priests, sacrifices, incantations, charms, and spells because it serves a purpose. Through this, through all of these, these are ways of getting in touch with the divine and the human. Therefore, through all of these arts,
pass all the communion and conversation between the gods and men and men and gods. They all go through love, for these are the arts of love. As a consequence of love serving that midpoint, it completes, it completes and binds together reality into a, into a whole. That means without love, it wouldn't be complete. It's incomplete without the mortal and love. Therefore, this is a dynamic model where all of these things transpire and flow through it. Now, therefore, since it achieves that great result uh, of communion and uh, conversation or dialogue between men and the gods and gods and the men, therefore, it has an interesting arena you see, it has an interesting arena. It can function this way in two arenas, which I should put down here. All right. Both awake and asleep. Both in the waking world and the sleeping world, for that's man's total experience between the two. Therefore, as he later talks about it in the Republic, that's the arena of dreams. The person then the person then who is an expert in these arts, the person who's an expert in these arts, then is called a spiritual person. And only that person is called the spiritual person in Plato. All right. So we'll give that person a halo. All right. And we can doctor them up a bit. Now, we might ask then, is there anyone in the dialogue who possesses these arts? Because if they have any evidence of being able to possess and function with these arts on a high level, they can then personify love. And since Socrates' teacher was a priestess, the art of the priests, she taught Socrates how to get in touch with the divine. She knows about divination. She made sacrifices before the Athenian population and was able to hold back the plague for 10 years, sacrifices. So if she then, through this dialogue, exhibits all of these qualities, then she can stand as the personification of love, can't she? If she has those qualities par excellence, then she can become a symbol. Or, if Socrates can show in himself those very qualities in the dialogue, then there's evidence within the dialogue that he can then deserve to be called the spiritual man, the symbol of these arts, and therefore the personification of them. Now, once you have this model, we can now say, how did love ever get here? I mean, what is the origin of love? And therefore, you see, this is where mythology, the mythology of poverty, plenty, and love fits in to explain that one fact. So the mythology serves the purpose of fitting into this model. And this model itself, therefore, should be able to detail for us right, the dynamics of love on its highest level, what it opens up, and therefore we have a standard by virtue which we can use. We can use this as a standard to see whether or not there's anyone in history, present or past or future, who might char be characterized as being able to function with these. If so, we have a way of understanding in what model they can fit. Ah. Now. There is an interesting thing that we have in this work. And that is, philosophy is the love of wisdom. Now, one of the great tragedies in the modern world 
is this great name, philosophy, has been used to cover a whole wide range of people who have nothing to do with philosophy whatsoever. They should really be called philodoxes, right? The love of opinions, because that's all they got is opinions. Because in this sense, let's see if we can do it now. If there was a way to bring us to this experience, then one would then be able to talk about the very nature of being, because they've experienced it, because that is ultimate reality. Since it's only known through the mind and the mind only, therefore the person who is to experience it must learn how to use that aspect, that part of the mind only, which is capable of seeing the nature of reality. When it's experienced, it is experienced as pure beauty. And in that experience of beauty, one discovers that the very nature of reality is no different than the purest beauty, and sees it as no different than mind itself. And therefore, in that experience, one recognizes that one is part and parcel of a reality that is nothing other than mind, and in, in its most intrinsic level is pure beauty. Ah, happiness. Now, if you know how to get there, if you know how to get there, if you know the steps, if you know how to get there, if you can talk about it from that experience, if you can communicate that experience to others, if you can then show how it plays an integral role in this game of philosophy, that is called wisdom. That's what he calls wisdom. What is wisdom then? If someone is able to pull off this great vision of the nature of ultimate reality and see into the nature of reality, sees that as the most brilliant light of being, the, sometimes called the great luminosity or numinosity. One discovers the nature of reality is divine, pure beauty, perceived as mind only, no different than mind itself. When one sees that, that awakens in the person a great love for that most beautiful thing, necessarily. Therefore, the person who experiences it awakens a love for that beauty, and therefore it must follow that the person who has experienced it must be a lover, philo, a love, have a love of wisdom. That's philosophy. Now, how do you get it? What do you have to go through? He has four stages, three processes. Ignorance, right opinion, Understanding, knowledge or wisdom. This is the way he describes it. Now, we must use only his language, not our own. We must never use our language in trying to understand the metaphysician. We have to use their language. You see, ignorance is to right opinion, two dots is to, as understanding is to knowledge or wisdom. There is a process that goes from one to the other. There's a process that goes from right opinion to understanding. There's a process that goes from understanding to wisdom. Therefore, there are three cognitive states, three processes between them, Ignorance is defined as that set of beliefs a person may possess 
What's ever in your head, let's use it that way, everything in your mind, whatever it is, is it sufficient to get you to reach the truth about the nature of reality? What's the truth about the nature of reality? This is the truth about the nature of reality. If you can't do it with that, then you can't hit the truth with what you have and therefore you are ignorant. No matter how many things you may know, no matter how many languages and degrees you have, it has nothing at all to do with intellectualism. Right? If your views, if the total set of your views cannot reach and cannot lead you to this kind of an experience, then you are ignorant. Now, if by talking about it and introducing it, you then gain a, a set of ideas, then you have opinions about it. But you don't know that those opinions are right and why they are right. That is to say, you don't know the reasons why the right opinions are right. Once you understand the reasons why your opinions are right, you have understanding. If you know how to use your right reasons involved in this study, that can lead you to this insight into the nature of reality, then that's wisdom. Therefore, there are three processes, four stages. Well, you have to uh, think of it this way. If you're traveling, and you don't know how to get to San Francisco, and you stop, and you ask someone, and they say, oh yeah, take that road and keep on going, three rights, and then you'll find the highway, stay on the highway, you get to San Francisco. You do the three rights, you get to San Francisco, you're relieved, and you start driving back. For one reason or another, you decide to go back the same way. So you take three lefts. And by heavens, by accident, you meet that man who gave you the instructions. And you stop and you say, I want to thank you very much. I forgot to thank you when you gave me the instructions. Thank you very much. You must know a great deal about San Francisco. No, no, he says, I've never been there. Well, how do you know that's the right way? He says, I don't know that's right. I've just been saying that for years. I've never been out of town. He says, as a matter of fact, he said, I would like to, uh, frankly, I'd like to know that. It happens to be the right uh, information, but... Um, Suppose you were to say, wait a minute, I have a map, and I'll show you something. And suppose you show them that three rights on the road lead to this highway, and the highway leads to San Francisco. Now, he's moved from having the right opinion. Now he understands why it's right, doesn't he? That's understanding. But he doesn't know that it leads there. You do. You went there. Therefore, there are three processes. Right? You didn't know, you had to ask someone. They didn't know, they only had the right opinions because they didn't know the reasons why they were right. When you came back, you told them why those reasons were right. Therefore, now they have understanding, but they don't have knowledge yet. They don't have the wisdom that accompanies it. The understanding comes through the model that you used to yeah. ask the man rather than the experience. I mean, like it sounds like the understanding has to come through some kind of guide or someone who's already been there. That's, that's, that's right. But it's not your direct experience. You're right. That's what we're saying. That's right. So is the model then this functioning then as an understanding? That's right. That's what it does. You haven't experienced it. You don't have the experience yet. See, some people may, may have experienced it, but they don't understand it. That it can come, this experience can come spontaneously. Some people have done nothing about it, have done nothing. No spiritual exercises, no yoga, nothing else. They're walking down the street, bang, they get an enlightenment experience like this. And Burke was one, if you want to read the introduction to his cosmic consciousness, he describes. He describes that experience. He's one of those people, walk down the street, bang out. Therefore, he would enjoy understanding 
the, all of this material behind it because therefore he can go backwards, can he? That's the difference between knowing that there is such a thing as this and understanding why it is such as it is and in when, within what context you can talk about and understand it. All right, good. Now, uh, in the dialogue, in the symposium, we meet people who have all of the qualities we just mentioned of these four. And we see that Socrates let some of these people who are ignorant remain the way they are. He chooses to select one to try to help him move from ignorance to getting the right opinions. But with people who are after right opinions, they can only go so far because they can't take the next step into understanding because this itself is quite a step for them to make. Therefore, this is Agathon. He can move from one to the other. He moves from one to the other. And Socrates says in the beginning of the symposium that he and Agathon shared similar beliefs about beauty and about the gods. Therefore, he started out ignorant. Only she, Diotima, his, his, his teacher, was able to take Socrates through the whole thing. Agathon Balk stopped here. He stopped when he just, well, what he did is he found that the ideas he had were ignorant. He found that he couldn't use those to understand. He was introduced to right opinions about it, but he couldn't get into understanding why they were right. So he stopped, he said, that's enough. That's enough, Socrates. Let it be as you say, and he quit. So therefore, he can only reach this point. So therefore, in, in the dialogue, you can map different people how far they've gone in this quest. Therefore, they can personify each one of these, can't they? See if we can pull something together now. All right. What if, what if we look at these names, ignorance, right opinion, understanding, and we say that we can identify people, and we just mentioned one, right? Agathon. And he went from to here. That was the degree of his growth. And then we can say Socrates went from right opinion to understanding. Second process. Right? By heavens. Suppose we go back to our table. Suppose we go back to our table and say, wait a minute, is it possible that we can relate these four cognitive states to poverty, plenty, love, and Aphrodite? Wait a minute, is it possible that we can go back to our beautiful table and now use it for a higher purpose. If we've identified these people as being in a certain state of mind that can be personified by that cognitive state, might we not be able to go back here and see whether or not they match those very qualities? Now that would be clever, wouldn't it? Oh. But wait a minute. Socrates doesn't go through all the steps in the symposium and the speech with, from Diotima. 
he's just, we just told of his recollection with his teacher. Therefore, all he reached was, at the best, understanding. Therefore, it breaks down. We're missing the third process. Therefore, it's a total failure. It was nice, but it was a total failure. Right? It'd be nice if we had the last one, wouldn't it? Bring it all together. But, unless you have an idea. I had not seen that maybe standing on the porch before he walks into this conversation was part of that drama. Yeah, well, now that you see that, that it is part of that drama, that's nice to know. But you have to do more than that. Because in that, yes, but if that's like poverty, if that's like plenty going no, in. No, um, poverty. Plenty. Plenty is in the door. No, poverty is in the doorway. If I understand what you're saying. The figure in the myth. Well, he was described as standing on, on the porch. That's and true. He lost. That's true. In that sense, that's in true. A different state of mind. Or that's know, absolutely true. That's right. Seeing that as, as well, like into maybe like plenty. So now he's going. But that was poverty, not plenty. It's nice that you want to change the name. I don't mind that. But. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you have two ideas and you don't see that. Put, no. Separate them and you'll see it. He's standing in the doorway. He may have passed out in the doorway. Now you have two. Okay. Now that you see him possibly in two, so what? So, now he's poverty in the doorway. Passed out, like plenty. And therefore he experiences beauty. And then following that are... is, is his speech. Yeah, yeah. And then gives yeah. a speech understanding but we don't have anything on that last piece do we the experience what? Oh. Pardon? the last piece would be the experience of the, is that the understanding that's correct that's what we're saying that's the last part of the yeah and we don't have that closure as the fourth step do we but he does have an experience he describes the experience in his speech he describes his experience in his speech. Socrates describes yes. his experience in the speech. His experience? That's what you said, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good, good, good. So it breaks down, you see. It was a good dialogue up to this point. There's a tragic flaw here. Well, some of the objections might be that uh, it's just going around in a circle. In other words, nothing ever new is really developed. You return from the, the beauty, then you return back. Nothing creatively That's true. occurred. That's right. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a cycle, but the cycle is where he continuously seeks to get back to this experience. Yeah, but could there be something beyond that experience? Yes, there is. There is. Yes, yeah. quite true. And what's beyond it must deal with what is called supra being, and this is just dealing. See, this is just dealing with the level of Aphrodite. You're quite right. Metaphysically, there's a higher range than this. That's quite true. Matter of fact, we're going to be doing that next week. Okay. That's where we're going. Yeah. This was, I was reading the book on Zarathustra, mm -hmm. and this was the objection that Zarathustra, mm -hmm. Zoroaster made. That, uh, yeah. It's creative. Eh? Promote what they call creativity, and mm -hmm. they thought that uh, mm -hmm. Plato was limited in its creativity. Yeah, okay, that's one view. Yeah, but we'll, we'll push it in a okay. different way. Okay. All right, we'll push it in a different way. The closest I can get is that when he talks about at the end of his speech where he says, I honor love matters myself and practice them particularly and encourage others, and now I always. And yeah. I would say. No, yeah, so. He's practicing it, so he's trying to get there. All right, that's close. That's we'll let it go with that. What about the reaction of others to him? What about the reaction? Well, of like others? he's got followers, attendants. 
Yes, he is a follower in the time. That's yeah, true. Yes, so the whole thing breaks down. See, it's a beautiful dialogue except for that missing piece. And that's called the tragic flaw in Plato's thinking. No? No. <laughs> Good, good. Now, if you noticed something curious about this talk tonight, it is not about the model and the myth, it's plural, not singular. And all we did is deal with one myth. And therefore, we're a long way from understanding if we need more than one to understand how Plato uses myths and mythology. Well, he introduces, now Plato introduces, two other mythical beings. A Selenos and a Marcius. Alcibiades comes in, the last speaker in the dialogue, and he says he is going to tell the truth about Socrates because no one else knows him as well as he does. But he says he must first let, he must first make it clear that to talk about Socrates he needs two figures, a Marcia and a Salinos. Now, the reason why it's important that he talks about the Salinos first is because he ignores it entirely until the end of the speech and then returns to it. But the Salinos figure is simply uh, a figure that has an opening, closed figure in, sitting, sitting posture, and it's often cloaked. And when you open up this little doorway, inside are carved figures, usually of the divine. And that's a Salinos figure made in figurine shops. And people take them and have them in their family altars and for sacrifices. So, a Marcia is a satyr, half man, half goat, you know, with a sexual proliclivity, right, and an interest. And the Marcia also is a flute player. And he once got in a contest with uh, Apollo about that matter. And so there's a whole story about Marcius. Now, if we've understood what we're doing, notice we can do the same thing now. We can say, all right, let us take the characteristics of the Marcia. And list them. And then let's see when he talks about Socrates, how he describes Socrates, and let's see for every point he makes about the Marcia, we can find a corresponding point about Socrates. And if he's doing that systematically, we should have a complete composite, should we not? That's what he's doing. Therefore, Socrates can per be personified in the figure of a Marcia. Why does he need two? Because he says, and that's what I would like to read for you in the end, is what he says about the Salinos figure, because he, he brings it so beautifully together. And by that I mean there's a certain set of ideas which all fit together, which re can be represented in this figure. Same thing we said before. What are we saying? If there is a Salinos figure, there must be a set of ideas each one of these set of ideas must be significant. And therefore, if we're going to use the Salinos figure to understand Socrates, therefore, each one of these significant ideas, we must find very clearly referred to Socrates in the way in which he functions. And if so, then we have understood how he is using mythology. Now, the interesting thing in Plato is that he never, he never goes beyond what he c 
characterizes by choosing someone in the dialogue, as an example, Alcibiades. Alcibiades has a long history, and uh, has a long history known to many of us. He was a general, he was a, a, a great drinker, and uh, he turned against the Greeks in a war, he did many things. Now, whatever he represents cognitively, we're back to cognitively, when Socrates uses this figure in the dialogue, he can never go beyond that set of ideas which represent that person. Therefore, when he's going to tell us about the truth about Socrates, and we do not agree, what we're doing is saying that Socrates may, and may personify philosophy and may be the symbol of philosophy if we can stick in that last missing piece. But if not, he's just the personification of it, but not ideally, and therefore not a symbol. So, Alcibiades says, I've never met a man like uh, Socrates, he said. And he lists four great virtues. He lists endurance, and he gives many examples of Socrates' endurance, especially in the cold weather. He walks in military, uh, with a military formation into the snow country without any shoes, walks barefoot, barefooted, and uh, he's able to endure those extremes. Right? And he only wears a very uh, thin cloak during the entire winter. We would call that thumos in Tibetan philosophy. He also talks about Socrates' great courage, and he gives examples of Socrates in the battlefield. And he also talks, therefore, about Socrates' cool-headedness, keeps us cool, or sound mind. Sometimes it's called temperance, but sound mind and cool-headedness is much better. And then he mentions wisdom. Now, why is that important? Because he gives examples of endurance. He gives examples of courage. He gives examples of cool-headedness. He gives no example of wisdom. Why? It's beyond words. Well, he does. For he, it's beyond philosophy, isn't it? Yes. If he were to talk knowledgeably about wisdom, then it would say something about what he's at. And if Socrates is characterizing him as someone who hasn't yet reached understanding, he would not have any insight into the nature of wisdom. Therefore, right, he can talk about these three, but not this. But therefore, in typical Socratic fashion, there must be something in the dialogue that could deserve that name if you know what it is. If you know what it is. Alcibiades didn't, or he would have called it wisdom. So we need two things, therefore. We need to know what wisdom is, and we, know how to, we have to see whether we can put in this great Salinos figure. Could I use your text, please? Could you pass your text for a second? Thank you, thank you. So, let me do it for you. Notice, now you have to give a name for this. Once there was a most dreadful frost and no one would go out of doors, or if he did, he put on an awful lot of things and swathed his legs and wrapped up his feet in felt and sheepskin. But this man went out in the weather, in that weather, wearing only such a cloak as he used to wear before and unshod, marched over the ice more easily than others did with boots on. Soldiers looked back at him, thinking he despised them. And there's a quote, so much for that, but here's a doughty deed the strong man did once on that expedition, and it is worth hearing, 
he got some notion into his head. And there he stood on one spot from dawn, thinking. And when it did not come out, he would not give in, but still stood pondering. It was already midday. People noticed it and wondered and said to one another that Socrates had been standing thinking about something ever since dawn. At last, when evening came, some of the Ionians, after dinner, it was summertime then, brought out their pallets and slept near in the cool and watched him from time to time to see if he would stand all night. He did stand until it was dawn. And the sun rose and he offered a prayer to the sun and he walked away. What's that? What state of mind is that? Ecstasy. Hmm? Ecstasy. That's some kind of very profound state of mind where you can meditate in one spot for 24 hours and not move. If, if that is, could that be a samadhi? Something like that. If that's a maha samadhi, then that is? But it could also be a trance. Could also be a trance. Yeah. But Alcibiades couldn't judge it. No. He didn't know. So we are left with the question. What name can we give it? And now let's go to the Salinos, all right? Now, Alcibiades now ends his whole speech on Socrates, and he believes he has the truth on Socrates beyond all other men. One could quote many other things in praise of Socrates, wonderful things. Of his other habits, one might perhaps say much the same about another man. And yet it is his not being like any other man in the world, ancient or modern, that is worthy of all wonder. Men like Achilles might, might be found. One might take, for example, Brasides and others. Or again, men like Pericles, uh, such as Nestor and Antenor. And they, were, they are more besides. And so we might go on with our comparisons. But as for this man, so odd both the man and his talk, none could ever be found to come near him neither modern nor ancient, unless he's compared to no man at all, but to the Salinoses and Citers, to which I have compared to him, him and his talk. Now, here we go. Notice the ideas. For there is indeed something which I left out when I began, that even his talk is very is very like the opening of the Salinas's. When you agree to listen to the talk of Socrates, it might seem at first to be nothing but absurdity. Such words and phrases are wrapped outside it like the height of a boisterous satyr. Pack asses and smiths and shoemakers and tanners. That's what he talks about. And he seems to be always saying the same things in the same words so that any ignorant and foolish man might, would laugh at him. But when they are opened out, when they are opened out, and you get inside them, you will find his words first full of sense as no others are, next most divine and containing the finest images of excellence, and reaching furthest, in fact, reaching to everything which it profits a man to study who is to become noble and good. So in the end of the speech, he goes back to the Salinos and tries to point out the singularity of this man in respect to what he's been describing. He gives us this puzzle, and it's left to us to solve it. Now, if he does, if he does, if you do, then look here. We have our great Diotima, his teacher, We have Socrates as her student. 
Then we have Socrates becoming the teacher, and he teaches Agathon. But look here. <coughs> we also have then Socrates in the same position as Agathon when he started, don't we? We have then Socrates as ignorance. We have Socrates gaining the right opinion from Diotima. She then gives him the reasons why they're right, and that's the whole dialogue, and therefore he then understands. And then if we're willing to say that Socrates in fact experienced wisdom in that Maha Samadhi state or a trance, we have to judge it for ourselves, then we can say he reaches wisdom. Therefore, how does he function? through all of those particular states and has gone through each of the processes and that is represented both in the myth and in the model and that's the basic architecture behind it and that allows us then to understand what they're doing metaphysically, mythically, through models, through cognitive functions, through the processes going from each one and how to bring up the mystery for ourselves because we have to have the mystery, that's the way he writes we then have to understand it and get on with it. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so, what would you like to ask about? I had fun doing it, by the way, as I always do. <coughs> Pardon me? <laughs> I that Samadhi state. That's right. That's right. <coughs> Socrates is likened to Salinos in that he sees the serpent, but it's full of sense and divine excellence, excellence and noble and good. That's right. There's nothing in the text that will let you say, see, there's my evidence for making that connection. You have to do it. You have to pull it together. In order to judge, you must have had, you must have had an experience yeah. Yeah. yourself. <clears throat> well, uh, we, know that, we know that in the last paragraph he goes around practicing himself, but we don't know to what degree at that <coughs> end of that speech whether he completed it. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. But we do have that very interesting question from Alcibiades when he gave that description of Socrates standing in one place and what might be a trans or a samadhi. But he couldn't judge because he's stuck at one he's stuck at a cognitive state, so he can't judge. So to whatever whatever yes, Alcibiades. That's right. Therefore Alcibiades judge couldn't judge it. Right. That's right. <coughs> and what's interesting is that you can get people who refuse to admit that there's even the possibility that Plato's method could, could reach, you could use it to reach the truth, that it contains the right kinds of opinions, that you can understand the reasons for those opinions, or what he's saying, and that it might be a yoga to reach that goal. We do know that he was taught the way to reach that goal because that's the, that's the great vision that's described in the eleventh paragraph in Socrates' speech with Diotima. Suddenly we'll perceive a wondrous vision, marvelous in its nature. And that's a samadhi, that's, that's an experience of beauty itself. But whether Socrates reached it or not, therefore we have a beautiful description of such an experience, but whether Socrates made it or not, even she wonders about it. That's a wonderful part. Let me, let me even she, she's really great. I, I like her. I like her, she says. Um, so she looks back at everything she said, giving him all the right understanding, and now she's going to give him a picture of what it takes to have the vision itself. 
So she turns to Socrates and she says, these are some of the mysteries of love, Socrates, in which perhaps even you may become an initiate. But as for the higher revelations, which initiation leads to if one approaches in the right way, I don't know if you could ever become an adept. <laughs> At least I will instruct you and no pains will be lacking. Try, you try to follow me, if you can. <laughs> I like her. <laughs> so she lays it out, then she describes it in that very beautiful language. And um, I should add one more thing to this, of course, that um, as a consequence of gaining this vision, According to Socrates, then one becomes a friend of the gods and immortal if any man ever is. Therefore, that brings you back up to the model, <coughs> to the immortals. So therefore, it completes it. Whoever shall be guided so far towards the mysteries of love by contemplating beautiful things rightly in due order is approaching the last grade. Suddenly, he will behold a beauty marvelous in its nature, that very beauty, Socrates, for the sake of which all the earlier hardships has been born. In the first place, it's everlasting, never being born nor perishing, neither increasing nor diminishing. Not beautiful here and ugly there, not beautiful now and ugly then, not beautiful in one direction, ugly in another direction, not beautiful in one place and ugly in another place. This beauty doesn't show itself to him like a face or hands or any bodily thing, nor as a discourse or a science, nor indeed as residing in anything as a living creature or earth or heaven or anything else. But being by itself, with itself, always in simplicity, while all the beautiful things elsewhere partake of this beauty in such a manner that when they are born and perish, it becomes neither less nor more and nothing at all happens to it. So that when anyone by right boy loving goes up these beautiful steps to that beauty and begins to catch sight of it, he would almost touch the perfect secret. For let me tell you the right way to approach things of love and then he gives a review of the whole thing. <clears throat> right. Does anyone ever discuss the division of Shiva, the eternal dance? Yes, yeah, isn't that lovely? Yeah, Leela, the, the, the yeah, divine play. That would be a higher state. Well, I think what we need to do is make sure we can come. Would you bring a description of it next time? Okay. If you have it, do you have it handy? No, I don't have one handy. Uh, I have the statue. I, I have, yeah, 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 yeah. I have only a, a modest description. <coughs> I'll bring it next time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Yes? Okay. Good. Thank you very much.